And so I will base my talk on a paper addressing a project that maybe some of you have heard of. It is the Canal Seine Nord Europe. So it's a huge canal, a huge waterway that is under construction for the moment. And uh, I based my talk on an investigation that was uh, 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 set up uh, three years ago. And, um, and the, the, um, uh, the research question about this uh, project was, when you have such a big project addressing climate change and promising to mitigate climate change by transferring uh, traffic in progress traffic on road to traffic on waterway with much less emission, is it possible to address other issues like biodiversity and the effect on water? Uh, is it possible to question the unquestionable uh, a project that seems so desirable that any critics would be on the wrong way, so to, way, so to say, on the wrong uh, side of uh, addressing climate change? And my, so my take on this issue is that, yes, we still need to address biodiversity issues, even for very desirable projects, because they might impact something that is uh, the, base, uh, the basis of our uh, life on Earth. Uh, and the idea is not to stop the project, but to improve the project so that it can yeah, uh, respect biodiversity. But the problem is, in a landscape or in a territory where um, the rate of uh, unemployment is uh, quite high, where uh, public investment is quite low, um, it's difficult to uh, give the impression that you critic uh, a project that seems so uh, uh, full of hope uh, for uh, the people. And so as a sociologist, when I ask people to uh, speak up about uh, the problem that this project may raise on biodiversity, most of the time th the answer is there is no problem of biodiversity. So that is the beginning of the story. How to go deeper than just this superficial response that we shouldn't question this project. So the outline of my talk would be on setting the scene as I just did. then present you the, the case uh, at stake, and then to develop a bit more about what is the, the sociological investigation that I propose in such cases, and how it can produce heuristical narratives, and I will come back to what I mean by this. So I told you, um, we need biodiversity, we need a climate that is more uh, suitable for life, we need to sustain life on Earth. But how to discuss such long-term stake when you have a big project that is very uh, urgent? Uh, uh, is it possible to address this? Or are these issues always undermined in public debate? And so uh, a philosopher, Hans Jonas, proposed the heuristic of fear as a way, so heuristic means the, the art of asking good questions in science, how we can ask good questions by taking seriously the fears of the people, the concern they have about maybe not the biodiversity as a whole because it is very abstract, but some very specific and concrete aspect of biodiversity. And when we have this concern, we as scientific, we may, um, grow this concern and uh, make them um, uh, more credible by adding a bit of science in it and saying, okay, you, your fear, there are some fears like the fear that the earth is flat. Well, we will not consider this, but there are other fears that actually they uh, resonate with the state of art in science and we can add to your point to say that it is a concern of uh, uh, legitimacy. And so imagining plausible threats uh, through social inquiry and then adding some biophysical knowledge, we can make this uh, threat, uh, this concern, 
a legitimate question on the different project. Let's go to the project. So the project at stake is a huge canal, uh, the Canal Seine-Nord Europe. Um, it is uh, on a track which presently there is an old canal, but the, uh, the capacity of this old canal is very uh, small. And so the idea is to leave the old canal uh, aside and to build a new uh, waterway uh, with the full capacity uh, boats need today for carrying uh, uh, commodities. Um, the geography of the Canal Seine-Europe is from Compiègne to uh, a network of uh, channels that uh, can reach Dunkerque, Zeebrugge, Rotterdam, and even Hamburg. Um, and so this connection is a link that is still missing and has been addressed in European uh, planning as uh, a link of uh, European interest and, uh, and uh, uh, importance. And what you see in this uh, other map is that you have the, uh, the old canal in blue and the new canal in red. So it's not far from uh, what exists, but it would be a completely new infrastructure. Do you have any question now? I think there are used to raise the question just after this, but please. Yeah, what happens to the old canal? Uh, it's just not the right capacity for boat. So it will, the question of what will happen of this canal is a good question. And we may see that it is part of the question that people ask. Uh, is it going to uh, sediment and um, be out of order? Would it be used for tourism? W these are questions that uh, the social inquiry uh, reveals, but uh, the question of why we didn't use it is was it, it was considered uh, too expensive to rehabilitate this one instead of building a new one. Um, what happens where they cross? Um, at yeah. Um, well, there is an infrastructure there that uh, um, I, it's a good question because I don't know how to ask it precisely. Uh, I guess that the water mixed there. There was another question or shall I continue? More precisely, um, the uh, uh, scheme of this channel is uh, designed in such a way that it allows water to cross not a mountain, but a small hill. And for any channel to cross a hill, you need a different level of the channel and the top one needs water because each time you are going to open the sluice, well, the water will fall down. And so at the end, you don't have any water at the top. So how this will be managed in this type of channel, it is called a channel with a, um, a sketch that is uh, of separation. And so the idea is that this is the river was, uh, they are going to pump uh, from the first step to the second step and then to the third step to a reservoir and this during winter so the uh, discharge in the river should be uh, large enough to accommodate this uh, taking <coughs> and uh, during summer uh, the top uh, sketch will be uh, uh, feed by this uh, reservoir and the originality of the design is that each time a boat uh, cross the sluice, the water will not fill uh, the downstream part of the canal, but instead it will feed a, an underground reservoir. And so the water will be pumped back into uh, where it comes from. And in order to keep the water in the canal, uh, and not having too much water in the reservoir. Do you see what I mean? Or is not very clear? Well, 
when you have two different levels of a canal and a boat is coming, usually what happens in different canal is that you raise the level of this one and so the water can cross or you, uh, you uh, empty this one and so the, water, the, the boat can go there. Any, anyway, <laughs> either you need some water to fill this one up or you need to store the water here and sometimes you just do that. But to make the canal again uh, useful for the other sketch, uh, sometimes, well, you need to adjust. And, and so where the water is going to is lacking from where it comes from. And so the idea in this canal is that it won't go far because there are underground reservoir to store the water and to, be, to pump it back. Okay, so we could say, wow, it's very intelligent because they will not lose any water. And we know that under climate change, water is very scarce and uh, uh, expensive and etc. And so, yeah, it's quite intelligent indeed. And, um, and that was um, uh, something that has been designed uh, to uh, minimize the water needed uh, from the wells. This project is also a huge and old project. Uh, it has been imagined uh, years before the 90s. And in uh, January 93, uh, there was an opportunity debate on this canal and it was uh, only 13 years, no, sorry. Yes, uh, more than uh, 15 years later that the first public hearing said, yes, we should do this canal because it, it has positive feedback and it, it was, the conclusion was that it was on general interest to make this canal. But then they open a call for uh, enterprise to propose uh, a price and a type of work and design. And, and the, 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 the public auctions actually provide offers that were way beyond the estimated costs. And so, uh, well, the public uh, initiators say it's not just possible, we don't have the money to make such a big canal or such a device. And so it was considered that it was a sort of uh, um, uh, hurting a stain mate. Uh, we can go further. Uh, we have to reimagine another offer that would be uh, uh, less expensive and only in 2015 they come with another a second public hearing with a different project that would uh, be less expensive a new declaration of general interest and that was where our study as sociologists began and then uh, in 2019 the government promises 1 billion euros in addition to uh, what was initially promised by the region and by the Europe, by the Union, European Union. And it was the feasibility, a financial fi feasibility of this canal. And so the canal opening is uh, forecast for 2027 or 28. So what you see is it's a long story. It's not just, uh, okay, we make a canal and the day after the canal is there, it's a long process uh, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, social acceptance, in terms of uh, um, uh, the design of the whole thing. But what I uh, have experienced in uh, uh, investigating the case is that um, the initiator, although he has uh, experienced all these uh, uh, heights and uh, lows, um, he has or they have much more information than any other stakeholders in the region. And so there is a, a discrepancy of power be, between this initiator that promise, promises so much thing, so many things, so uh, 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 a big project that the region has never uh, experienced before. And other uh, stakeholders who might have some critiques, but actually they don't have much means to address these critiques. Uh, we could imagine that the state, the, the offices of the state service 
might be uh, a counter power to this initiator, but that's not the case due to a high level of turnover in the uh, state service. NGOs are not independent completely from the initiator because when a, such a big initiator is promising a project, uh, there are many opportunities for NGOs for doing part of the job in terms of addressing uh, the impact on biodiversity and etc. So even NGOs much um, concerned with biodiversity have some positive impact uh, from the initiator because they will be given some uh, studies. And so it creates a, a, a dependent, dependence from uh, these initiators. And so all this climate or social climate is not in favor of addressing critics. Um, when we turn back to the old canal, uh, we see that uh, it experienced the same story of a, a long process of designing this canal. And at the end of the process, the canal capacity was considered too low. Uh, and so there is a, a, a first concern about this new project. Is the process so long that at the end of the day, we are going to have a huge canal, but it, was n it wouldn't be uh, the right capacity anymore because this happened in the uh, past. The existing Canal du Nord works were initiated in, in uh, 1913. It was interrupted between both wars and then it was completed in 65. And here you have uh, a picture showing uh, what experienced the canal during wars. Well, it, it was actually uh, uh, used by tanks and it was not used by water. And so uh, you see <laughs> any project may end, uh, experience very different narrative than what was designed. And, and so uh, given this uh, concern, we started our sociological investigation. The institutional context uh, in this uh, investigation is that it is the first canal that is going to be built since the law on nature protection. So that means that the previous one was before this law. The first canal to be built after the uh, law on water in 92 and just after the law on biodiversity. So there is a new, completely new institutional context with much more constraint than what was previously experienced by uh, channel initiators. So the question is, which biodiversity stakes for such a waterway? How we raise the questions? Uh, are we going to ask questions about fish or about frogs or about forests or about uh, um, whatever? What governance on these stakes and how do stakeholders understand the issue? So our first pilot interviews, because when we are sociologists before uh, listing all the questions, first we go to the, uh, to the case and we start to address some question, very open question, and to see what people are talking about in this area uh, when we talk about the, the, the canal. And what was really amazing is that people use words that were the words of the initiator. So the society that was built to build this canal had proposed some designs. And so you see them here. They propose to, um, uh, to set some uh, lagoons on the banks so that it may enhance the biodiversity on the banks. They say that to cross um, the river Somme, uh, there will be a huge bridge with water on top. And so the Pont Canal is another um, uh, hot spot of uh, attention. And a small uh, river that is really well known for being completely degraded uh, is going to be restored. And so when we ask people in the field, what do you think about this canal? Uh, what would be the effect on the landscape and on your practice? The first thing that they bring is actually the discourse of the dominant actors who are prom promising this canal. Well, this is not surprising, but it's a confirmation that there is a lack of uh, um, uh, articulation of other topics. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. 
question. Uh, the interviews are held with just local citizens or like proper stakeholders that are somewhat invested in the project? Both. And we are quite trying to uh, see all the people that uh, are going to be involved. But um, to be more precise, because it's an investigation in sociology, but also in political science, and we are interested in decision and how people make decision. And uh, um, we will focus also on people who are able to take some decision, even on decision on the information that should be provided. So NGOs are going to be involved in the investigation. But the ordinary perception of people is on the second uh, uh, scope of the study. So because it is so huge that what people have in mind are the image that are promised by the project and we, were, we want to go deeper, how we do that? How you, we, we try to get uh, people understanding, people knowledge about their uh, environment without being submerged by this image of the project. For this, we used a methodology that have been developed in my previous uh, uh, research, focusing on forms that are perceived in the landscape that are also um, motives of concern. So there are some forms. Um, it can be um, the cuttings in the landscape. It can be uh, the, uh, the lights of the harbors. It can be things that people can perceive and to which they can attach a motivation or a concern. Other forms, other motives of concern. This is quite abstract. Let's take an example. Here I show you uh, a piece of art that normally you don't know. And it is uh, someone with flowers uh, in the back. What do you see in the flowers? Well, each of you may see very different things, especially because it's a bit blur. But let's take some seconds to reflect on what type of forms do you see in these flowers? I'm sorry if I'm... No, no, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. So that people online can also. Okay. Hmm. I mean, on the most abstract um, level, because then I would see. Like yeah, the mic, please. The For the people online. Um, so, on a very. Shall I also say my name and company? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. The names is afterwards. Okay, uh, Lennart from Germany. Uh, on the left, I see like almost a round sphere, but if I want to see it, I can also see it like heart shape. Okay, so there is a heart shape there. I can imagine that some others have seen other things. So just to keep a, a sample of these perceptions. The closest thing to a flower I can see is a dahlia. Okay. So maybe here you see a dahlia or no? Okay. If I have to stretch my imagination, you see a flower. Okay. Let's take just a one, uh, or maybe somebody who didn't take the floor before. I see a fish, orange eyes closing in agony, and behind it I see a <laughs> <laughs> horn, a horn cob. Okay, a horn here. A corn, <laughs> corn cob. Oh, corn. corn. Uh, Okay, okay, so we s <laughs> there are many reasons why we should see different things. But the, pur the purpose of my experiment is to tell you that what you see is very cultural, and what is cultural means that it is learned. And so we are going to experience a learning process where collectively we are going to see the same things. And I can force you to see here 
a sort of uh, green dog with uh, glasses and a mustache. Can you see it? There, and some uh, white hair on the top. Okay, I give it up, I put it back, I give it up, I put it back. Now, if I remove it, you have been learned to see uh, forms, a form. You don't know exactly the sig significance of this form because it's not a political significance, but I gave you a name and so now I'm sorry to say that I <laughs> you cannot s help to see it. Uh, I have forced your vision to see it and now uh, probably I uh, destroyed the, the pleasure you had to see it without any form of vision, but uh, I drive you to see what I wanted you to see. And my purpose is to tell you that in the landscape, it's the same thing. As uh, children, you have been told to see what a dog is, what a nice landscape is, and this is cultural. And so what we as, sociali as sociologists, we want to do when we investigate a case on biodiversity is not to have people say, oh, biodiversity, in the uh, newspaper I've seen that uh, uh, maybe uh, the whales uh, in the north are under threat, but what in your neighborhood you consider as maybe not biodiversity, but what we are going to consider it as biodiversity and what you experience as being in your landscape with some significance. So the mode of investigation is to let people speak about their landscape, their practices, do they cycle, do they fish, do they uh, um, just um, smell some uh, uh, bad odors coming from uh, an incinerator or whatever. We want them to speak about their experience of the landscape and what do they fear about the consequences of a canal in their surrounding? Do they fear that there will be more trucks? Do they fear that there will be more noise? Do, well, whatever. And gathering all these fears, all these concern that can be described as new forms in the landscape are going to be what I call forms and motifs on concern, but in one word, motif, like a motif in a material. Okay, because the landscape is full of motif and we can associate this form to motivation, a play on word, motif. And it's an incremental process of investigation. First, interviews with uh, um, my colleagues, so uh, three other investigators, and we collect uh, many verbatims from different people. And then we gather our findings and we group some forms together because they correspond to the same motifs of concern. We enrich this motif with bibliographical documentation and additional interviews. Sometimes in interviews, people do not express any concern about anything. And so at the end of the interview, because we don't want to frame the interview with our perception, but at the end of the interview we said, you know what, some other interviewees, they are concerned about birds, and you said nothing about birds, is it something of interest? And some, sometimes they say, oh yes, birds, I didn't dare saying anything about birds, but actually, and they will comment, or they will say, no, it's not my concern, I have no interest in birds, okay? And so we will, at the end of the interviews, force a bit their perception to get a sense of is this motif, a shared motif, a shared motifs of concern or not. And we will see that it is for some and it is not for others. And then we have this material of forms that convey a sense of concern in biodiversity. What we do with this collection? We do scenarios and we are going to to um, to sew this motif together to get something that has um, a consistency scientifically 
I need to make a small uh, addition to uh, the concept uh, concerning policy tools. What we are going to address is to ask people, do they consider that what they are uh, um, anxious about, uh, do they trust policies and policy instruments to make it right? Uh, do they consider that the law on biodiversity will make things just right? Or do they think that it will not govern our interest or it will not uh, respond to our fears? So how do they trust the policy, in the policy tools, the policy instruments that are laws, fiscal and economic tools, contracts, information, norms that are all deployed on this project but may not really um, settle uh, everything that is on stakes. And so what we have in mind is that we are going to collect motifs that are well known, that are inscribed in law, that are uh, protected by law. Uh, for example, forests, for example, um, um, uh, for example, some uh, body of water. Or, uh, so these are established because there are some laws that say how it will be protected. But there are others that are not really protected, that are not really addressed, that are still under debate and their contour is also under debate. And we are going to ask about policy instruments and how they may govern this and how they interact with each other. So this is our framework of coding verbatims. And then when we have all this collection of motif and all these verbatim, we can do some nice graphs about uh, who is speaking of what, about which canal, the old one, the new one, uh, what are the established motifs of biodiversity. And here, sorry, it is in French, but you can see that uh, 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 drinking water is an issue for the new canal. It's not an issue for the old one, because the old one, we know uh, uh, how it's uh, uh, performed. But for the new one, it may affect the resources that are today used for drinking water. And this is an issue. Um, the protected uh, species, this is also a new concern for the new channel. Uh, but uh, the, the, the concern on fish, Fish is also an issue on the old canal because the way the old canal is uh, maintained sometimes kills fish. And so this has been raised in interviews and we have some cases of huge pollution that is not uh, uh, correctly addressed with the set of law, etc., etc. We also ask, and we can see through the material that we have collected, that um, some established motif um, are very discussed as not being governed correctly and so whose governance is mostly discussed and so uh, the um, farmland for example is something that is really under discussion especially through legislation but also through the contracts and so it, when you have a huge canal like this it will cut uh, into farms and so uh, what will be proposed to the farmers is an exchange of lands and instead of the ones that they are going to lose um, the public authority is going to propose some exchange and some offset. Um, well as you see it's a huge item of discussion and it's not settled. Another point uh, that is under discussion and people are really questioning whether laws and contracts will make the job of securing uh, the issues is on wetlands. And especially because when you dig a canal, you, you drain the land and you may drain the wetlands. And so this also is a question. And when you take some water from the Waz, the Waz River, well, the wetlands around the Waz River may suffer. And so this was a big issue. So to give you some results, and then I will move to the scenarios. Well, interviewees blame policy inconsistencies, and this was quite interesting. 
For example, they say, well, there is a, a, an old canal for the moment, and it is not maintained. It is really poorly maintained. Um, so is it the most urgent to make a new canal, or instead can we invest to maintain the one that is in place already? Or, um, and especially not in this case, but when you see the uh, old territory of France, where there are many waterways in very bad shape, is it the most uh, priority to invest in a new one? Or could we make it better on the ones that are uh, profitable but not maintained uh, at the top level? And another inconsistency that was raised was the promise that this canal will make a difference on climate change by diminishing emissions because some transportation that used to happen on roads is going to be transferred on waterway. But to do that, economists have proved that you need a tax. Otherwise, it's not interesting for uh, all the uh, uh, operators that are operating on road to change their practice and to go on water. And so for this to happen, you need an incentive. And this incentive is not set. And there is no political uh, uh, decision made to raise a tax so that it may be more interesting on what way is it? Wouldn't cost be an incentive? Different costs being cheaper? Yes. That, well, to raise a tax, you have different uh, uh, vehicles. So you might just tax on roads, but you can also subsidize on a channel, but then you have to get the money to subsidize. And it much, would it be through um, fiscality? I just mean it being cheaper to transfer a bike. Oh, you mean yeah. without doing anything? Mm -hmm. Isn't it cheaper? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not cheaper because you have um, um, uh, investments that have been made in roads that makes it cheaper on road. And uh, to have your commodities on ships needs uh, new investment, new um, logistic chains that are not in place for the moment. So no, unfortunately, it's not cheaper. And it, it requires especially people devoted to make uh, the transfer uh, at the end of uh, the destination. And this is costly. Um, another subject of concern is what, uh, because uh, the infrastructure is going to, destruct, to, to destroy part of the biodiversity, uh, there is this new opportunity with the law of biodiversity to offset these losses. And so instead of having the biodiversity that was there before, you promise that in other parts of land, you're going to increase the biodiversity that used to be there and there will be an offset. Okay, this is the promise. But people that we in, uh, asked say, okay, we believe that there will be an endeavor for that at the beginning of the project, but at the end of the project, are they some uh, security, some, some certitude that people will maintain this new biodiversity that so that we, we are not in a in situation where uh, we had a, low, uh, a loss of biodiversity there, a promise of a high, but, but that may not raise the top level that is needed to make the compensation possible. Um, another thing is that, so I, I described different policy instruments that can be mobilized to govern all these stakes. And there are some uh, policy instruments that are um, regulation that are uh, uh, prohibitions, uh, obligations, laws. But you have also more voluntary instruments. And you propose uh, that uh, um, the industries invest in uh, waterways and you encourage them to do so and you provide some information for that but it's on a voluntary basis 
And what we see is that people in the, uh, um, our interviewees say, well, we would, m we would trust much better laws than voluntary agreements because we don't know exactly if they will deliver that promise. Whereas the initiator of the project is talking and talking about voluntary agreements and there is a discrepancy there. I will shorten the last one. And then what I want to show you is what, we, what can we do with all the material that we have gathered. And so the, the, the idea is to combine them, but I need a, a process for combi combining them because you can imagine that with 10 or more motif, I can do many, many different stories, okay? And so the first thing is that I give them uh, different salience, this motif, to create a narrative. I can say, well, this issue is uh, articulated today, but tomorrow nobody will care about this motif. So I give it up out of this scenario. That's the forgotten motifs. Some are going to be um, voiced, but people will be... Um, uh, okay with the policy instruments that are in place to govern their concern. And so it will raise the agenda, but the decision will be trusted. And there are other motifs, so some forms that are going to uh, be in the landscape and nobody wants them, and the policy instrument will not uh, propose something that is acceptable, and you will have social mobilization against these forms. And so the motives of Concern will drive social mobilization and it will become a hot topic, okay? And so you have three modalities for 10 motifs. Then uh, you can imagine that it may do a lot of narratives different, but you select a narrative that is consistent based on science because it's not possible to imagine that uh, this motive will disappear because more uh, possibly uh, it disappeared with floods and in the same narrative you imagine that there is no floods. So you need some consistency uh, between the motives. And another rule for imagining scenarios is to contrast these scenarios. So I put in the process some huge contrast that are uh, very general narratives on the cr ecological crisis and these narratives are one, the techno-optimist narrative that technique is going to solve all the problems of climate change and biodiversity and so on, and resource uh, decrease. So this is the first big narrative. The second one is that the state is going to rule uh, uh, abuse and uh, exhaustion of resource, and so um, Whatever the cost, the state is going to invest to secure these issues. And the, sec the third narrative is the narrative of degrowth, where we should be much more um, uh, precautionous on resource and to con consume much less resource. Okay. And so forcing the narrative based on this big thematic, I propose to uh, combine what has been said in the different interviews in terms of um, 10 motives, so 10 motifs that are also motives of concern. So the first one is whether or not the canal, the future canal is going to be there. And I put a calendar because it's also a question of calendar. Uh, are the works starting or not? Is it postponed or not? So the, the first one is basically the channel. Will it happen or not? The second one is what the initiator called the leaving canal. They do not promise uh, an industrial canal. They say they will be life in this canal and they have promised the lagoons on the banks and also the fish in the uh, waterway and etc. Will this happen or not? Um, the question of the fluvial harbor, 
where are going where they are going to be uh, is it an issue w will it be discussed or not then you have the question of the water discharge will uh, water be enough or not uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, where the water is going to, to go. A, a big question is that in this area, you have what uh, people call the, the larger reserve of water and clean water for all the uh, region, and especially for drinking water. Is it possible that the canal drain this drinking water? Uh, this is a big issue. Would it be possible for fauna to cross the canal? Are there corridors or is it something that is like a frontier that uh, 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 impact biodiversity. How the works is going to create externalities um, by um, noise, but also by poussière, I don't know, dust. dust. Because, you know, uh, that can be a real nightmare for uh, repairing uh, people of uh, big uh, public work when they have all that, this dust coming in their house and etc. If they were okay for a canal in abstract to be there, then when the works began, uh, it may be a big change of, in their habits. And, and it might be a, um, a motif for mobilization. The future of offsetting measure I already addressed, the road traffic, the incident in the canal, because when we look to the old canal, we have a series of anecdotes of how it has evolved and leaks in the um, uh, leakages in the past, but also cars being uh, 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 thrown in the canal and also uh, dikes of the canal uh, with the bridge. And so uh, many different incidents can happen, can happen in a canal. Would this happen? And the possibility of muds, because in this region, it's a region of uh, big crops um, or large uh, croplands and uh, with very intensive agriculture leading to mud flows when there is a heavy rain. And so will this mud come to the canal is also an issue that was raised during our interviews. And we are going to uh, weight uh, these different motif with their different silence. That means salience. Are there going to be hot topic or topic governed by policy instruments or forgotten topic? And what you see this there is the way we have weighted the different motif. Among us, sociologists and ecologists, to make a narrative that is consistent. And it makes a narrative of concern. It makes a narrative of what can happen that is not desirable. And it is Ba it is uh, it's, um, uh, intent to raise attention to why biodiversity may matter in this project. So maybe to make it short, I explain you how we make this narrative. I'm making just one and then we can uh, go to the questions. So um, the first scenario. Uh, oh. Um, yeah. So the first scenario is the idea that public works go well with carbon accounting and offsetting measures. And so you see the works, you see how they uh, suppress some biodiversity, but they promote another set of biodiversity and uh, carbon accounting. And what you see there is there is no question about uh, the canal is going to be uh, built or not. It's not an issue. It's a forgotten issue. I still have my motif, but it's not voiced. Uh, the, the way the construction site is going on is not an issue either. Um, and the way the offsetting measures are organized um, is controlled by policy, so it's in grey. What happened is that uh, there are sub um, subsidies uh, for the trucks that are going to use the waterway and there are taxes for a road and so 
Uh, the traffic is governed by tax and uh, by other policy instruments. Um, during the winter and uh, so, sorry, during the summer, there are some accidents in, in uh, um, the um, impervious surface of the canal uh, that is suffering, but it is addressed uh, by new subsidies. Um, everything is really perfect. It's a really or uh, uh, perfect green canal. But the, the, what says the narratives, it, at what cost can we secure all these issues? And so it has a heuristic of if we are taking, if we take seriously all these threats, it has a cost. And then the scenario can be taken by people who are living in the area to address, well, I've heard that uh, leakages can be an issue and I've seen uh, what it makes in terms of impacts and I address this question to the prefet or to the public hearings. So we built a scenario on a really green canal uh, but with a cost because under climate change what has been imagined for vegetation may have to deal with parasites that are new uh, due to climate change because um, uh, the banks that are lagoons are going to be uh, um, impacted by muds because there are uh, large uh, mud flows in the area. So what this is going to, uh, how it will change the landscape, what is at stake what the state has to invest to keep it green, so to say. And then we had another scenario where uh, public uh, uh, construction site didn't go well or, or wouldn't go well, and uh, especially because dust is a problem, but also water. And, we and so you, I just want you to have in mind how we build such a narrative to ask questions in public debate, especially when the debate at the beginning was not open and people didn't dare asking questions. And so with this narrative, we imagine that it makes it easier to challenge the current dominant narrative of the initiator and addressing more specifically question of biodiversity. So I have the different drawings for all the narratives and we can come back to it but I would like to foster discussion and so I jump to my conclusions and I say well it's very difficult for any people to grasp abstract or never experienced concepts and most of the time when you go to see people who are not specialists of biodiversity biodiversity is exactly this abstract and never experienced concepts and so the novice is helped to mentally recombine details from past events to construct meaningful novel scenes and to imagine what it could be in the future. Why am I concerned with biodiversity? And um, explicitation of a collective representation is built from memories, from concerns, from moral and political consideration. And here I want to stress the fact that it is not just a question of what are you uh, uh, interested in, uh, what is uh, uh, your attachments and etc, uh, which is nothing political but just uh, uh, leisure and uh, uh, culture, uh, but it is also a question of which society we want for the future. What, we want degrowth or we want techno uh, positivist future or we want the state to be here. So of course my three scenarios are very caricatures, but it raised the political issues. And it's difficult for a sociologist that is not born in an area to imagine what is very important for the people. So the, the purpose of the investigation is to get some concern by a different context and to, yeah, to, 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 um, flesh out this context with what is really important for the people and especially what can be uh, threatened in the future. Thank you.